Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. Many children in the United States do not have access to quality books, and one in four children will not learn how to read them. To discuss the societal effects and what can be done to change it, I'm joined by a woman who's devoted her life to getting books into the hands of children in underserved communities. She's built what is today the largest clearinghouse of new books in the nation. President, CEO, and co-founder of First Book, Kyle Zimmer. Kyle, what a delight to have Lovely you here. Lovely to be here. You know, I, I, when I thought about this segment, I thought we cover politics, we cover things that are happening around the world in the culture and religion. Right. There are a few things as important as what we're talking about now because it's not only something happening in real time, it happens and reaches into our future. It, it shapes does. everything. It does. I want to talk about First Book. This uh -huh. is an amazing organization Thanks. which we're going to get into. But I want to talk about you. You were a Attorney in private practice. I was. You're volunteering at a soup kitchen <laughs> and a shelter, and you came I across was. a child. Tell me what happened and how it led to First Book. Well, you know, it even started earlier than that. Really? It did. I was raised by parents who had a very deep social justice conviction mm. and who believed very deeply that education was a cornerstone to every social issue. Wow. And so I had that as part of my DNA. And when I hit Washington and many, many years ago went to law school here mm. and then went out and began private practice, it was right in the middle of the crack epidemic. Wow. So it was a tough time for my hometown mm. here. And I decided that I needed to do something. So I did start working at a soup kitchen after, after my, you know, work day. Nine to five. Yeah. And, uh, and I went over and I met the teachers there, you know, people who were working their hearts out. And every night I would be there, the place would be filled with kids, you know, 40, 50 kids who were doing everything right. They were looking for a safe place to be. They were looking for adults, you know, mm -hmm. to have in their lives. And the one thing that struck me over and over again was that there really were no books. Huh. And so my, uh, you know, I sort of made myself a student of that issue. And I went in some of the local schools and realized how under-resourced they were. And, and just began, you know, putting together an idea that has grown all these years, myself and a couple of dear friends. And it was a market-based solution to it get is. books into the hands of children. I want to I yeah. show people how dire what we're talking about really is. Look at this graphic. There are 32 million adults in the United States who are considered illiterate. That is about 14% of the population. Now, Kyle, why? And what are the consequences of illiteracy as these children become adults? Right. I, you know, I think we always focus on the child because mm -hmm. the tragedy is so visible in the kids we're talking about. And there have been many multiple studies to show uh, what we're really dealing with, it's almost impossible to overstate the issue. When you're talking about kids, some of the studies show that in the toughest economic neighborhoods, you've got one book for every 300 kids. That was a study out of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Most recently, right here in Washington, they showed one book for every 830 low-income kids. And just to balance that out, um, in an average income neighborhood, there were about 13 books per child. Mm. And so when you know that books make an extraordinary difference in the life of a child, just even having 20 books in their home mm. has an extraordinary, it, it's, it moves the needle for that individual child. And that's then now you've got a real problem to work on. And so we've been focusing on that all these years. Mm. And, the, and the correlation between incarceration, yep. welfare, family breakdown, and illiteracy is really, all these studies show, there is such a correlation. That's it is exactly so intense. right. And, and, you know, while it starts with the child, mm. these kids grow up, mm. you know, and they grow up into virtually unemployable adults who struggle to support their families. 
they struggle mm -hmm. and and put burdens on the justice system. They put burdens on the healthcare system. Yeah. They and and even at the bigger level, Raymond, the the tragedy of our democracy. You know, we're all here. We are in the middle of the presidential elections, and yeah. we're all rightfully proud of this democracy. But the truth is, is that it falls short if we leave this many of our citizens to Behind. the side. Yeah, well, you're making such a difference. I want to give people a sense of what you're doing. Sure. Poverty is a big factor for many of these communities looking for access to quality books, particularly for children. Now, First Books works with one such community in Los Molinos, California. Watch this. I've lived in this town for 40 years. The poverty that is here is unimaginable. We have children that are homeless. They don't even have enough to eat. They don't even begin to know, unless they're reading, what kinds of jobs they might have, careers they might have, where they might go to school, because all they know is this area. We've made a commitment to give them five books a year, and they so look forward to it. They're able to see that maybe I'd like to be a teacher. Maybe I'd like to go to college. There are so many things that it is offering them in the world that they would never have known about if it weren't for reading. This is the thing that, that has hit me as I've traveled around talking to tens of thousands of kids now in schools all over the country. You see how it opens up a world for these kids. And, and you see where they live and the small world they're in, and right. books can take them to places they'll never go. What have you learned from these educators? And I know that's what you all call them, right. whether they be in churches or they're in YMCA or, or Big Brother, Big Sister programs or in schools. Right. What have those educators who are part of your network taught you mm -hmm. about this crisis and how to encourage literacy? You know, one of the most important things we've done in first, at First Book over the last 25 years is aggregate this network of 275,000 members. And these are people, these are heroes. They're working in Title I classrooms. They're working in homeless shelters and healthcare settings and libraries in every imaginable setting in towns and big cities, little towns all over the country. And we keep now in constant touch with them. We survey them constantly. Mm -hmm. And it tells us what we need to do as an organization. But it also opens our eyes to a lot of the issues. And mm -hmm. to, to your question directly, you know, we learn some things that are so tragic. Um, we learn about how profound the need for food is. Wow. Right. And and we learn some things that are surprising, for example, that uh, school uh, school attendance drops very significant during the colder months. Okay. And so first book stepped up into that mm -hmm. and realized that what is what the barrier is, is having a coat. So oh for gosh. heaven's sakes, let's get coats. So now, on you, the now you have to provide food and coats to get them to the literacy. Exactly, stage. exactly. Because what we want to do is remove every single barrier. Mm -hmm. But even as to the books, we hear lots of wonderful feedback. For example, one of the big points that they make to us repeatedly is they need books that reflect the cultures of their children in their classroom. Mm -hmm. And so First Book has taken a very strong step with a program called Stories for All. Mm. And this is an issue that people have been worrying about for 50 years. You know, you can dig up articles where people were citing the lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. And that lack, it, it impairs the kids from those cultures. Sure. But in truth, it impairs all of our kids because mm -hmm. Books are all, always, they are windows and they are mirrors, yeah. right? And so we've done a lot of great work in promoting, and I brought a few samples in promoting brand new authors into that space. Mm -hmm. Because of the size of our market now, we're actually able to elevate books that are wonderfully relevant. To and this publishers market. are responding to you oh, now yes. and kind of crafting books with uh, Hispanic characters, uh, African-American characters, uh, uh, people in poverty. Absolutely so right. So it's, it's a more diverse offering. So they're really 
playing to your audience. Absolutely. Tell me about right. the two quickly about the two programs. You have the first book, Marketplace. What is that? The first book, Marketplace, is a really groundbreaking program where what we said to the publishers is when the average price of a premium picture book is $18 in the U.S., you are really only selling to the upper five or maybe 10 percent of the market. And what we need to do is develop a strategy that allows you to lower your prices and make them very, very accessible. So the first book marketplace is our strategy for that. It's an e-commerce site that offers more than 6,000 award-winning titles, and the average cost of a book on that side of a paperback book is about 285, and that includes shipping. Wow. So, and it's great books. Some of the classics yeah, to like- To Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird, some of the wonderful oh books that no kid should grow a up. A very hungry caterpillar. Very hungry caterpillar. And, and oh. even the ones like Diary of a Wimpy right. Kid that, ca you know, it captured the imagination the of every, every yeah. young, young man in, yeah. in the middle grade. And, and you, to qualify for the marketplace, you have to do what? What are the qualifications? I mean, not um, everybody can go. You can't use this as Amazon. Exactly correct. Our, our market is completely limited mm -hmm. to serving those in need. And mm -hmm. so you go on to our site at firstbook.org mm -hmm. and you register with us and it will ask you a series of questions. And you have to either be a Title I school mm -hmm. or you have to show that you're serving a minimum of 70% children in need. I see. And it's a very simple process. It takes mm -hmm. about five minutes, but we want to make sure that we confine our work to focus on the kids who really need it. And I mean, help. for people who are uh, schools, yep. I'm thinking schools in poor communities, Absolutely. and there are a lot of them. I know I get letters from teachers who are watching, and I thought to myself as I, as I became aware of your program, what a resource this is for them, right. because it's a way to get new books from the best authors out there into the hands of these kids now. They don't That's have to right. wait, and it's not cost prohibitive. So what a gift that is. The National uh, Book Bank, what is that? Well, the National Book Bank is our other big jet engine, and what it does is we recognize that publishers they get you know, returned inventory, excess inventory, 25% on average of every book that's published is returned to the publisher. Hopefully not mine, but certainly thank you. not Go yours. Ahead. Certainly not <laughs> yours. We'll see. Go ahead. <laughs> but and and all of that inventory has a wonderful value yeah. to kids in need and the program serving them. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole separate system called the First Book National Book Bank. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's registered with us can have access to those books. Those books are donated by our publishers, and we work with like the top 90 imprints in wow. the US and Canada. And they never pay for the books. The books in that category are free. They just pay a shipping and handling fee of about 50 cents per book. It's amazing. It's fun. I, I, I want to show people this graphic because it's so sure. important. And uh, you know, I see, when you see literacy up close, and you, and you see its absence, it's profound. 77% of children who are read to are more likely to read or attempt to read on their own versus 57% of kids who don't have regular story time at home. How do you drive this message home? And how essential is that interplay between the parent and the child having a book read to you? You know, there's no substitute for it. And I mean, and, and having any adult read to you, mm -hmm. you don't have to be the parent. Right. You can be an older brother and sister or an aunt or uncle or mm -hmm. a neighbor. And I think sometimes there's a lot of advice and parents, and I'm a mother of two boys, uh, we get a lot of advice. And sometimes it sounds, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like the stress and the pressure is on us. The single thing I think parents and caregivers and caring adults need to remember mm -hmm. is to have fun, yeah. is to have fun. If you're having fun reading with your kid, your child is going to enjoy it. They're going to love sitting close to you. Mm -hmm. That's going to be special time. And some parents struggle themselves with their own skills. And yeah. maybe it's a language. Maybe they're learning a second or third language. Mm. But what they need to remember is it really doesn't matter. It's that interaction. It's 
listening to language. They can open up any book and talk about the pictures. They can make up their own stories. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself is just tremendously powerful. Yeah. So you can forget a lot of the rules and don't just forget that don't one. forget to have fun with your kid. How has this personally impacted you? It, it must, I mean, I know I, I get letters from, from people. I can only sure. imagine what your mail looks like. Sure. And you go out to some of these communities, to some of, of the people in your network, you interact with them. What's left the most profound impact on you 20 years later? You know, I, um, I wake up every day feeling like the luckiest person in the world. I do. I, I work with people I love on a mission that I think is essential. And I think, and, and there are moments that bring that home to you. You know, I remember when we um, held a big distribution not far from where I grew up in Southern Ohio. Oh. And I walked in and books were piled high on tables. And a little boy ran up to me who could have been my son, like an eight-year-old, came flying up to me and said in his best Southern Ohio, you know, ma'am, do you have any Spanish books? <laughs> and I looked at him and I thought, wow, things have changed here, you know? <laughs> Southern Ohio. Southern Ohio. And I said, are you learning Spanish in school? And he leaned close and he said, he said, no, but... I know that this is my big chance to learn it. And so, you know, you have those moments, you get those letters, you have those interactions, and you think, I'm the luckiest person in the world mm -hmm. to get to know these people, to have uh, the chance to make a difference. Well, you do incredible work. Kyle Zimmer, thank you for being here. Thanks and so it's firstbook.org. It is. People can sign up. Follow the, the prompts there. Yes. And you can see how you can help get involved, get access to quality books for children in your community. It's a firstbook.org. And be sure to follow my literacy program. I'm at storyented.com, and we're going to link to your site as well. I love that. <laughs>